So without further ado, I want to introduce our wonderful guest tonight, um, along with the being the lead alto saxophonist in the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. You've seen our guest with such legendary musicians as Marcus Roberts, Roy Hargrove, and Elvin Jones. Um, if you want to hear some of his newest works, you can hear his comp composition, The Ballet Inferno, recorded with the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, and his new newest small group recording, Cerulean Canvas. Uh, so without further ado, let's welcome the wonderful Sherman Irby. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. Um, thanks to all of you all for, uh, for being a part of this, participating, uh, watching. Uh, one of the things, before we get started, I just want our younger people to understand that um, everything I say here uh, is basically what observations that I've made and things that were shown to me by other musicians who were, uh, you know, giving me direction uh, in my uh, life and and uh, the vision that I had of becoming a jazz musician. Um, as we go on, as we go through this, this, uh, this talk about improvisation, I would suggest that you all take your pens and papers out to write it, write uh, as many notes as you can. I'm basically going to give you all a bunch of information, those observations and, and, and things that I were taught. And um, so, you know, in order for you to get it all, it's hard to get everything on the first pass and, and they're probably going to reshow some of this stuff. Uh, but try to make as many notes as you can for uh, those of you all in, 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 in school. Uh, you know, you are being taught how to take notes. Uh, so this will, <laughs> this will help you in your classwork is to give you a good opportunity to do so on a subject that you're really going to enjoy. Um, plus the actual, you know, to write stuff down is, is very good. Okay, here we go. Jazz improvisation. Uh, jazz improvisation is a celebration of the individual's voice and creativity in jazz. All right. So we're going what we're going to do is discuss a road to improvisation. This is again my road, my observations, the things I've learned. We're going to talk about these subjects. Learn songs. Steady harmony and harmonic movement. Rhythms and rhythmic feel tools to create drama, and of course, the blues. Now we're going to start with learn songs. The function of a solo is to make improvised, inspired melodies over sonic material. Now that's my definition. That's what I say a, a solo is. Improvised, inspired melodies over sonic material. Now, I didn't say over chord changes. I didn't say over rhythm section because that's not always the case. It could be just noise in the, in, in the audience and maybe you're playing solo by yourself without other instruments, and that's still a solo. Or it can be playing with the drums only or with the bass only. So that's why I say other sonic material. But the greatest well of uh, melodic material it's always going to be found in composed music. The composer has a time to scrutinize the progression of notes, the length of notes, how to relate to uh, the chord progressions. You know, when we're, when we're improvising, we're going on feel and, and, and other knowledge uh, that we have learned, but it's, it, it's improv, but it, it's spur of the moment. It's not as thought out as someone composing a piece of work. They sit down with the melody, they, they come up with a melody that goes along with some chord changes that they may be hearing or certain movements uh, and, and certain directions that they want certain instruments to go. There may not be a particular chord uh, change, but uh, uh, an assortment of melodic lines. But that's all well thought out and they have a, a reason for doing so. And so it's always going to be better something that you can sit down and think about for a few hours compared to something that comes like that in um, uh, 10 seconds of a chorus or 15 seconds of a chorus. 
All right. So we say that the, the greatest melodic material is found in composed music. Now, there's certain types of music that uh, 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 that jazz was formed on top of um, that you're going to need to learn. All right. Uh, we know that the blues is big, but outside of the blues, we're talking about where you can get melodic material from. The first one is the Great American Songbook. Now, the Great American Songbook is the canon of the most important and influential American popular songs and jazz standards from the early 20th century that have stood the test of time in their life and legacy. All right, so first of all, we're talking about the pop tunes from the 1920s through the 1950s that was created for Broadway theater, musical theater, and Hollywood musical film. One tune, I'm just going to give you a little bit, is a tune called All of You. That's a pop tune from the, uh, from the 20s. From Tin Pan Alley, which is uh, another uh, set of music that you need to learn. Uh, that was popular music from the uh, from New York City publishers in the late 1900s to the early 19th, uh, the late 19th to the early 20th centuries. Um, songs like Sweet Georgia Brown and Whispering. I know y'all like know Sweet Georgia Brown. That's an old song, uh, but songs like that you do need to uh, you do need to learn because of the melodic material. Jazz standards. And what I mean by jazz standards, I mean early jazz standards, um, like Basin Street Blues, and even Indiana. <laughs> material that you can use. Now that's the Great American Songbook. Bebop standards. Okay, we, for a lot of us, um, a lot of you all who are, who are just starting out, I know you've listened to a lot of Charlie Parker, some Thelonious Monk, some Dizzy Gillespie. All right, but this, uh, you need to learn as many bebop tunes as you can also. Uh, the melodic Mel melodic material changed with bebop. It got more, a little bit more complex, and people start to understand what they were hearing and can hear the, and hear that the stuff is melodic, and it was all worked out. <laughs> Start recognizing all of those fast notes as being melodies. All right, so bebop standards that's another uh, well of information that you can use. Now, uh, also modern jazz standards. We're talking about compositions from Wayne Shorter, uh, Joe Henderson, John Coltrane, Chick Corea. Uh, here's some uh, Joe Henderson. <laughs> beautiful that th that melody is that's recorder made from Joe Henderson that's stuff that you're going to need to learn because it gives you an idea of what a melody is so when you're playing a solo you're not just spewing uh, 
uh, stuff based on the scale or whatever, but you, you're actually trying to create a melody. Okay, so now you start listening to these things. You start really starting uh, uh, to understand, okay, this is what I need to listen to. Again, the Great American Songbook, Bebop, and, 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 um, and Modern Jazz. All right, so now you need to learn the melody. Okay, this gets fun. Now, it's best to, to, to get to the piano to learn a melody. People say, you know, well, I play, all I do is play saxophone. No. Most jazz musicians, including drummers, spend time on the piano. The reason being is that on the piano, you can see everything. It's like 88 keys of an orchestra, all right? Uh, it's hard to visualize harmonic things based on the instrument that is playing only one note at a time, like the saxophone or a trumpet. So, how do you learn a melody? First, you have to listen to the melody of a song, the melody of a song, as often and often as possible from different artists, not just one. You know, and, and because of that, if you do that, you learn how melodies are structured and presented. Now, it's almost like when, when uh, you're a child, when you're an infant, and you don't really know how to speak. You learn how to understand words from your parents speaking and reading to you. You learn the length of sentences, the rise and fall of pitches, you know, phrases, what we call phrasing, and even soft and loud, how powerful something soft can be as compared to how powerful something loud can be. Um, so listening as often as possible to a song is very important. Say, for instance, that, that first song uh, I played, All of You, you listen to uh, some early, like the maybe the very first rec uh, recording of that. Maybe listen to the way Miles Davis played it. You know, a lot of different people play it. And then you get a, a sense of, okay, this is how the melody can go. And then you can start making adjustments how you want to play it but based upon listening to what they do. Because that's what's going to happen. You know, eventually all of this feeling of new information is going to give you, uh, is going to give you carte blanche of, of, of everything out there in the world that, that you can do to a certain song and make uh, uh, an informed judgment, an informed decision about how you're going to play a song. Okay, so you listen to the melody. Now you need to write it down. Okay. I know this is the new day and age. And I use Sibelius also. You know, everybody's doing stuff on the computer. Some people are not even writing this stuff on the computer. They'll, they'll input it into Logic or Pro Tools and then then use their software to, to uh, create a lead sheet. You cannot, you cannot underestimate the power of writing things down by hand using a pencil, pen, or paper, and paper. It's very, very important. Uh... It has been proven that handwriting is a combination of motor skills, touch, sensation, and visual perception actually reinforces the natural learning process. I am a true believer of that. You know, for, uh, for me, that, is, that was the way that I learned things, writing it down, taking notes. The things that the teachers, you know, going to school always taught us to do. Okay, so... Now you got to write down a melody and the changes to a song. You're going to make a lead sheet. Say, for instance, you're going to learn all of you. You're going to take that melody and you're going to write a lead sheet for it. So you can take your, a, a piece of staff paper, whether you gen generate the staff paper from a program or you buy you some, uh, some paper, you know, or get some paper from your teacher. And uh, uh, on the staff, you're going to write nice, beautiful lines. And uh, because a song like, like all of you is basically in four-bar phrases, you're going to do four bars, to uh, four measures to a line. Make sure to put the clef in there. Put your seed, uh, key signature in. And then neatly write the melody on the paper. Pay close attention to how you do it. Take care. Treat that thing like gold. In the process of doing that, 
you're going to actually really learn that song up and down. And do it in concert, not in the key of your instrument. You can take the time to do that. And do it one song at a time. Or, you know, you can also use a, a, a stock uh, score or something from a fake book as a reference point. And I say as a reference point because nine times out of ten it's going to be wrong. So if you take a, a say for instance, you go into, into a fake book and uh, and they have a scrapper from the Apple or uh, like I was looking at something, Prince Albert. I was looking at, at, at one uh, book that had Prince Albert. And they had the notes. Most of the, the rhythms and everything were fine, but some of the notes were wrong. Uh, if they were in the key of A flat and at times when it's supposed to be a, a B, a D uh, natural, they actually had a D flat in there because it was they forgot it was in the key signature. They make those mistakes. Whoever, whoever they is, they make those mistakes, but you should not. You can take that as a reference point, look and, look, uh, go and listen to the recording and say, okay, that note is wrong. Let me write this down right. You can mark it in there, book or whatever you have, and then take the time to neatly write it in your own lead sheet. I, I encourage you to go and 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 uh, learn this year twenty songs. Now, as a jazz musician, we have to learn like 300, 300 400 tunes uh, before we even come up here to New York to to try to get into the scene because you never know what they're gonna call. So that's why that earlier part of listening a lot that's gonna help you regardless. Because you're going to need to learn these tunes. You're going to need to be familiar with these tunes. So, make your lead sheet. Make it beautiful and clear. Now you need to write the chord changes above them. Figure them out. Take the time to figure them out. Uh, for those of, you who, uh, those of you who do not understand your chords yet, talk to your teachers. Talk to your mentors. And they will help you. If you don't, if you cannot understand something, if you're transcribing a tune, and you don't understand what chord it is, ask someone. It's okay to ask someone. Uh, and then write that down. Make sure to put the chord in the right place. And then when you're finished, you have a piece of art. A beautifully written uh, uh, score, lead sheet of a song that you're probably going to play for the rest of your life. Alright? I have like a a bookcase full of uh, lead sheets that I did over the years. It helped me remember this stuff and understand what, uh, how the music was put together. Okay? Now, you don't have to write the lyrics. I know most of the tunes have lyrics. Uh, but I, you don't have to write the lyrics. But I suggest that you become very familiar with them. I'm not saying that you got to sing them because I don't sing. But I do know most of the lyrics to... to Quite a few lyrics to the stuff that I, that, the songs that I do know, especially from the American Songbook. Um, and for the, and for the words that I don't know that well, I make up good ones. But I do, but I do have a good understanding of what the melody should be and how it corresponds with the words. So, you know, you don't have to write them down, but don't run away from learning them. Okay. Then the next step of that of learning the melody is that you need to play the melody. Uh, one thing you can do to uh, in playing the melody is you can simulate how various artists plays a certain melody. Again, all of you. Why don't you try to play it with uh, uh, with Miles Davis when he plays it? Or with Benny Carter or, or, or any number of artists that have played the song. Uh, try to simulate how they would do it. And then as time goes on, you figure out your own way. And one of the things that that um, that you should also try to do is to make the the uh, the words be heard. Uh, again, with all of you, I like the look of you. The charm of you. You know that kind of thing. You 
that too you can hear the middle the uh the words from the way that i played it even with the embellishments that i did i tried to think of how a singer would do it because they still have to get the words out even when they embellish okay now studying songs will give you the tools to make solos that are full of melodic development and diversity while connecting you to the history of jazz and all american music now that's important so you're killing a lot of birds with one stone. Listen to these tunes. Learn these tunes. Remember, the same songs that you learned, the same, one, same ones that, that uh, Lana Hampton might have played, or Louis Armstrong, or Benny Carter, or Roy Hargrove, or Elvin Jones, or McCoy Tyner, or Chet Baker. You know? So it will connect you to, uh, it will connect you to, you know, the, the stream of history in this music. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, I've got somebody um, just quickly asking if, if you could go in a little deeper about learning chords and figuring out chords and their extensions, especially um, if you have a specific method that you use or used when you were learning. All right, that's the perfect se a segue because that's part two. <laughs> uh, all right. The next part, study harmony and harmonic development. Okay. One of the things that you have to do as a musician is to understand chord qualities, extensions, and modes. All right, what I mean by chord qualities, major, minor, augmented, diminished, uh, dominant chords. Uh, when, when you talk about extensions, you're talking about dominant chords. Uh, ninth, you know, 11, sharp, sharp 11, 13 chords. And with Mohs, Phrygian, Locrian, you know, that type of thing. All right. And I, I want to make this note. If you do not know your major and minor scales, you know, as well as you would know the alphabet, you're going to have a hard time learning this stuff. Uh, what your teachers have been telling you over and over again to learn your major and minor scales, very, very important. Because that gives you the foundation of what you need to understand in order to make a chord. Let's say, for instance, um, a major ninth chord. Okay? That's uh, if you do it in the key of C. If you know your C scale, C, B, D, uh, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C, when you go to, that's eight notes right there. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, that's, that's, that, that's your eighth. And ninth would be, uh, 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 would be a D. All right, so that's the ninth note. So you have the first eight notes are your scale, and then the ninth note would be D, which is the same as two. When we make chords, we think of, one, three, five, seven. All right. So one is a C, three is the E, five is the G, B is the seven, and then the ninth, you just continue on. I'm gonna play this on the piano. And see, you may not be able to hear it, but maybe. All right. That's your ninth. That D is the ninth. So your your. A major ninth chord, uh, C major nine chord will be C, E, G, B, and D. That's all it is. And the reason I know it's right, because I know my major scales. And it's the same type of situation if you were talking about in G flat. G flat, B flat, D flat, F natural, and A flat. Because I know the notes of a G flat scale. All right? It's not, it's, it's not as difficult as you think. But it will be difficult if you do not learn your major and minor scales, all right? And, and, and I press upon that. As a matter of fact, I think the scales that you need to work on 
major, minor, augmented, and diminished scales. That gives you everything that you need. All right? So, when you're looking at a chord change, you're basically dealing with something that, that is based upon a major scale. That's a lot of work to, to do on top of that, but that's basically what that is. Uh, the other thing when you, uh, uh, that you have to do is understand and hear classic quarter movements. And what I mean by that, the movement of a five to one. That's probably the most basic movement in music. And not just American music, I mean just music in general. That that's that sound of, of five to one. Alright? So if you can hear this, if we if we're still in, in C, then G will be five to C. You're always gonna hear that. Another one is four to one. That's the same as Amen. That's 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 four to one, and then another one I I, I like to, to to always put in there is five to a small one. And what I mean by a small one, I mean a minor one. So that five that you, that we played with G to go to a one, which is C minor. Those are your basic movements that you have to uh, have to know and hear and recognize when you listen to music. Every piece of music has this. You know, in, in, in college we had a, cla a class called um, Form and Analysis. We would write all, all this stuff. We would look at a melodic line and we would determine if that note would be a part of a two or five or six or whatever it is. And, and and be able and be able to understand that and then say okay these are the tools that we need uh, to be able to do surrounding neighboring tones surrounding tones that type of thing turns uh, that will define what a chord is whether it's major minor or it's that type of thing I'm not going to go into all of that today because that's that's just a lot to go into uh, but I want to tell you to be aware of those things and to ask for help to learn those things. Understanding the five to one movements, four to one movements. It's a, and, and, and another thing to consider about this is that those movements are not just related to the key of a song. We're just talking about a movement. In every song, there are a lot of many modulations occurring to create drama. Okay, I'm saying all this and you're going to understand why. To do that, a chord would take the function of a five or a four to create a new one chord. All right, I'm getting deep into this. But you've been dealing with this all along because I know that all of you all play the blues. Now in a 12 bar blues, so let's, say, let's take a, 12, uh, uh, a B flat 12 bar blues. The first chord is a B flat major six chord. That's, that's how I've, I, I view it. When you listen to older styles of music, they, they deal with that with the sixth chord because it, it's a home sound. That's another conversation. Uh, but let's say that B flat sixth chord in the fourth in the fourth bar of a twelve bar blues is a B flat seven. We deal with that all the time, right? B flat seven chord, the fourth measure. Then we get to the fifth measure, then it's an E flat seven. Okay. Now mind you, we just left out of the sound of a of B flat. All right, the B flat seven, it takes the function of a five to get you to a new one, which is the E flat seven. B flat to E flat. Okay, trust me. Just write this stuff down, and if you don't understand, you can ask about it. I, I, I'll reiterate it again. Uh, but it's all based upon the scales that you already learned. So we go from B flat seven. I'm going to play it on the piano, see if you can hear it. That's five. We do that on the blues all the time. All right? That's five to one. That And, and what it is, is not the five of B flat. 
it's the it's a new five. It's a chord that is taking the function of a five to go to a new one. We do it all the time, and in music we call it secondary dominance. We're creating another dominant, another five. When we say dominance, most of the time we're thinking of it being a five or four, but mostly a five. Now it sounds difficult, but it's not. You just have to recognize them. You know, when you when you are starting to work on these songs, you start to recognize these things. This is the reason why we do all of this other stuff. This is the reason why we learn the songs, we write the songs down. We start recognizing and observing things. All right? And you can do a lot of this on, on your own. You just need help. With, if you need help with a few things, that's fine. You ask for it. But, you know, one of the things that you learn how to do in school is learn to observe and make notes, study. Because you're going to be doing that for the rest of your life. So apply it to music also. Everyone else did. Why do you think Bird was carrying around scores? He was studying those scores. Everybody did that. Everybody studied. You're not going to learn this music by osmosis. Okay? Now, there's a lot of songs that were, that we, you, you'll see like these five to ones is going all over the place. And uh, you don't think about it. But it's creating is using secondary dominance in order to get this kind of movement and get and create drama. Two songs I can think of that that'll be good for you to listen to, and start and see if you can recognize uh, those five to ones. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie's "Con Alma." All right, difficult tune. You need to learn it anyway. Learn it. Write it down. Make that one of the tunes that you're going to study. And John Coltrane's "Giant Steps." Everyone thinks it's the most difficult tune in the world. That's not the case. Giant Steps is a study of five to ones. So, you know, listen to it, check it out. All right? The next thing you have to do after you, 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 you uh, start figuring that out is that you have to explore harmonic and harmonic movements in songs. Like I said, you know, study these things. I'm going to give you a few examples there for you to check out. Um, recognize the tendency of certain things in songs. How songs have multiple bars in one chord and how people use five to one movements in order to create melodic lines. Check out Dizzy Gillespie's Things to Come. All right? Or So What? See how they created melodic movements in their... Uh, uh, how, how they create harmonic movements in their melodies over a long form of uh, one chord or two chords. Uh, Eric Dolphy, I, I'm doing a study on Eric Dolphy right now, and he talks about that being one of the hardest things to do. Uh, you have to study that, and you will find that that using movements of five to one and four to one within those uh, within those chord within those one chord or two chord songs will get you a long way because that's how we move things. Um, explore connective tissue. That's a term that I use. Uh, it, it basically, a, you're studying how one section is connected to another. It's like the things that hold your muscles to your bones. You know you have muscles, you know you have bones, but you have things that connect them together. All right? So, you have an A section of a tune, then you go into a bridge. How do you connect the A section to the bridge? How do you connect the, the bridge going back to the A section? What happens in those in that beat or two beats before going to that next section? Even on a smaller scale, what happens if if if, if the song has four bar phrases? What happens every four bars? How do you get from one section here from the first four bars to the eight to the next four bars? You know, do you just skip over that information? you skip over that? Just ignore that? No, you can't ignore that. Study what that is. Know that. Use that. The great jazz musicians, they play over sections like that. They just don't stop right before they get to right before they get to the end of a section. And then wait to start again. They connect the two together in their solo. On. They play over the uh over the sections. 
So explore the connective tissues. Check out Cherokee. You know, one one of one of the good exercises that I, that I found is that figure out how after the fourth bar, how do you get to the fifth bar? Okay? And after the fourth bar, how do you get to the fifth bar? Uh, after the eighth bar, how do you get to the ninth bar? How, uh, just, just check it out. All right. Uh, note to chord relationship. Observe what notes dictate the quality of a chord. Okay, you understand? You're saying, okay, what is he talking about? If you're playing a C7 chord, tell me what notes dictate the quality of that chord. You know, good observations. Check out piano players. They can tell you right away because they do it in their voices all the time. And Monk was a master of it. Check this out. I'm going to play a C on the piano. Okay. Do you have the sound of the C? Now check this out. You can still hear the C in there. The two notes that make the quality of a chord are the third and the seventh. Let me repeat that. The third and the seventh. And I want you to observe that. I want you to see how that is shown. I want you to see that how it's how it shown when you do your transcriptions. Uh, of, uh, of of solos of, of of songs to see how especially of songs you do the transcription of songs you'll see how composers use that to define what chords they are hearing or what they're trying to portray even if it's out even if it's like an out kind of sound like if you if you're learning some some ornette coleman tunes check out how he would use uh, how he his melodies, you can hear what the chord changes are, even though it may be sounding different than the chord changes that the rhythm section is playing. Just understand that the third and the seventh define those chords, okay? Um, and also a question is, does it matter what part of the beat that the chord note falls? Okay, I'm going to say this again. It's a question that you probably have to answer. Does it matter on what part of the beat a chord note falls. All right? Now, you also need to determine scales for chordal movements. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, some people that know me, they, they know that I don't think about all those exotic scales. They never work for me. Uh, again, there's many ways of learning. But for me, I just believe in the major and minor diminished and whole tone scales. I think I think with those scales, they cover everything else that I need. Um, now, if you enjoy a scalar approach, you know, because you know, me, I, 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 I'm more of a chordal person. But if you enjoy a scalar approach, I believe you can use your knowledge and ears to change a note within the scale to fit a chordal movement. All right. If you plan, if it's if it's a C, say for instance, uh, um, if it's a C, uh, a C dominant with a sharp eleventh, all right, that's something that should sound like this, something to that effect. Where well, you're gonna have a C, and and you're gonna have an F sharp in there, which is your sharp eleventh. You can change the scale. Either by adding the F sharp in there into your major scale, into your dominant scale, or you can just you can just bypass the G and just play F sharp, or bypass the F and just play F sharp. Anyway, those are things that you can make up with your ears alone. Now, that's some that's that's real easy to do, but trying to remember a certain kind of this is a so and so and so and so scale, that that didn't work for me. That's another thing I need to kind of remember. I just know it's, this is a C7 with a sharp level. Okay, it's a, C, it's a C7, uh, C dominant thing, which is basically an F scale anyway. All right? Again, everything is based off the major and minor scales. 
And I only say minor scales because you have the harmonic and melodic to contend with. All right. Um, so I'm a chordal person. But I, I don't think in a scalar way, but it's okay if you do. Um, I think of uh, chordal movements and chords on top of chords and related chords, things like that. It gives me more freedom to go in many different directions. Uh, but that's for me. That's how my brain works. I know everybody is different. So in your own journey through playing this music, you will find your own direction. There are many different roads uh, to the same destination, which is trying to play this music correctly. Play it well and, and contribute our part to it. Uh, are there any questions that we need to address now, Andy? Just had a sort of a follow up on that. Just I think that the person asking about learning chords, but just even like when you're transcribing a tune, how you how you hear them specifically in the context of a song. Yeah, it's okay. And it's a good question. And it's a question that takes a lot of time. Um, this is what I would say. Uh, if you're having problems hearing a certain chord, I, I suggest that you start start going back to those those earlier songs that you can find a lead sheet for to give you a foundation to start on because it's something that's going to come over time i can't tell you how to hear uh how to hear uh um uh, 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 c13 i can't tell you how to hear that that's something that you have to practice and 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 work at by listening all the time and observing and, and studying it's just something that you have to do um if you don't put in that time of listening, it's, just, it's no way of doing it. Uh, you can see it in the book, but it doesn't teach you how to listen for it. Uh, if you transcribe it, the more you transcribe and try to transcribe, the better you will get at it. You need to sit at a piano to do it. If you're listening to, say for instance, you listen to, um, uh, let's say Miles Davis at the Black Hawk, and, uh, and Wynton Kelly is playing a voice in four chord, uh, they're playing a song, uh, Rhythm Changes, and you're trying to figure out what, what this chord is. Listen to what the bass player is playing, and hopefully at some point they'll play something that sounds like a root, especially in the melody, you will hear a root. And then uh, listen to what the piano player is playing and try to figure out each note. And then you will recognize, okay, this note going with this bass line, okay, this is going to be the root of the chord. This is a C. Okay, I hear E natural. I hear uh, I hear A, I hear D. Oh, this may be a C six nine. Oh, okay, this is a C six nine. Go back to your books. Go ask someone. Try to play it on the piano. It, it's just it's something that's going to take time. I didn't have anyone to show me either. I had to figure it out. I start just listening to stuff and just trying to play it on the piano. But many of you are read music already, so that is an advantage. Uh, but it's, again, it's not going to come by osmosis. you got to listen to it. you got to listen, study. One, just one other quick question. As far as building a foundation of learning tunes, um, is there a place, a set of tunes, a time period, musicians that you would point people to if they're just getting started? That would okay. give them a great foundation to build on to more advanced stuff. That's fine. Okay, let's 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 go back to the uh, uh, to what we talked about in the beginning. Uh, we talked about the American, the Great American Songbook. A tune like "All of You," a song like "Blue Skies," a foggy day. I got rhythm. That's from that. That's from the Great American Songbook. Those are pop tunes. Okay. Uh, Sweet Georgia Brown. I'm again, I'm gonna say those names again just to make sure that you heard them. All of You, that's by Cole Porter. Blue Skies from Irvin Berlin. A Foggy Day from George and Ira Gershwin. And I Got Rhythm from George and Ira Gershwin. I Got Rhythm is basically the foundation of, of all, uh, 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 of a lot of the bebop and and jazz um, and jazz I mean throughout 
You know, that's like like an anthem. We've had so many tunes that were built off of that, and we play it all the time, even with no melody. We just start playing rhythm changes. That's like a thing. That's like a thing like the blues. Um, and I said, you know, I said the jazz standards like uh, Basin Street Blues, Memphis Blues, um, St. James Infirmary. Those are very important songs that you need to learn. Those are a good start. I'm going to give you a recording that uh, I give everyone. This is like, this is like my thing. I, I, I love this record. It, I learned so much from it. It did so much for me. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Red Garland. It's a Red Garland, uh, Red Garland trio a recording called A Garland of Red. Again, it's A Garland of Red by Red Garland. If you take the time to learn all of those tunes on that record, they're all standards. Take the time to learn all of those tunes. Then that would be a very good foundation. Okay? Do not underestimate how informative a piano trio record can be. And that's coming from me, a saxophone player. We think that, we, okay, we got to listen. We got to listen to Train. We got to listen to uh, the Cannonball. We got to listen to Bird. got to listen to Dolphin. We got to listen to Kenny Garrett. We got to listen. Yeah, we have to listen to all of them. But you learn a lot from George Shearing. You learn a lot, you know, from Dave Brubank. You learn a lot from Earl Gardner. You learn a lot from Wynton Kelly. You learn a lot from McCoy Tyner. The way they play melodies, the way they connect it with the harmonies, the arrangements that they come up with, it's a wealth of information in there. All right? We're going to talk about a few more things and then uh, uh, and start to wrap this up. Rhythm and rhythmic feel. Now, this is this is kind of thing that's was kind of hard to explain, uh, but I, I want you to I want you to write these things down so you can you can start to recognize these things. Uh, recognize the Charleston. I know none of us grew up with the Charleston. Know what the Charleston is, uh, but the generations before us they knew what that is. It's a rhythm. one of the early examples of syncopation that, that, that we use in popular American music. All right? You can use that in so many different ways. a good thing to to uh to listen for the charleston you'll hear it a lot of times drummers will play it you'll see it in a lot of songs you recognize that that uh in the history of the music and um you recognize that in, in people's playing um and, uh, and other types of syncopations um Composers use the rhythms and apply that into what you do. Also, one of, one of the beautiful things that we learned from bebop was how important the triplet was. So when you're studying bebop, when you're learning how when you're learning how to solo in that style, when you're learning the songs from, from uh, that period, it introduced the triplet as like the thing in the horns. Um... Okay. 
you know, you can use it in many different ways. It creates drama. Also, it gives you a, a way of getting from one part of your horn to another. So recognize those triplets. When you learn these, this music, recognize that rhythm. Now, articulation is something that I've been preaching about for a long while, especially with saxophone players, because th sometimes we get a little lazy on it. You need to practice articulation exercises, right, in your playing. And then when you're, when you, when you, when you're studying, we observe how, how greats articulate when they solo. Write that stuff down, all right? Now, again, practice your articulation. Many different ways of doing it. I, I, I'm not going to go all, but you can go. There's many different ways you can do that that make it easier for you to be able to, uh, to incorporate it. You know, in time, you're not even going to think about it. You, that's going to be part of your phrase and part of your style. Um, so you, you work, just make out some exercises in order uh, to work on that. A lot of times I use, when I start, I use the stuff in the beginning of the um, Universal Method book for saxophone. There's exercises for tongue and Lacrosse and an Auburn book, you know. Just go back to your earlier books. They're in there. Uh, now, you also need to observe how the greats articulate when they solo. When you listen to Charlie Parker, Check out the way that he articulates, where he puts his stress points. Make notes of your observations. They will help you to recognize a musician when you hear them. Plus, you may like to use some of their style when creating your own style. You know, uh, listen to Cannibal Adderley and, and make note of how he used articulation. You know, it, it'd be good to do. If you transcribe a solo of his, write the articulation down. If you'd like to transcribe, do that, okay? If um, a good exercise uh, that, that I tell students, go get the Charlie Parker Omni book, okay? Uh, I got one right here. A friend of mine gave me one because I haven't had one in years. Charlie Parker Omni book. I am not endorsing this book. I'm just saying this is a resource. Let's say you take a song like this, like Anthropology, okay? It has no, if you look at it, it has no markings for articulation. It's just notes and the basic rhythms. But that doesn't give you all the information. That doesn't tell you how Bird played. That doesn't give you the notes that he played. So go back and listen to the recording and write in the articulations. When you hear him play a note hard, put emphasis on something. Um, say for instance, like when I played uh, Scrapper from the Apple earlier. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's not all those hits that I did, all those, um, um, all of the accents that I, that I use, they're not in there. The Mikados, everything else, the staccatos that I instinctively use, they're not, there's not going to be marked in here. So you're not going to really know how Bird played. Write the stuff in, all right? That would be a good exercise for, for you all who may not be transcribing stuff but want to study that type of thing. Um, the other thing that you need to do as far as rhythm is concerned is understanding that lope. Okay? This is another thing I preach. All right. You practice all the time. You, you study all the time about um, you practice and, uh, and study playing straight in time. Okay? And it's good. So, bo bo do bo dee be dee be do bo do bo dee be dee be da. But you need to do the same thing with the swing feel. Now, there's a degree of lope that you can do. Okay? And instead of me just trying to, trying to show that to you, I'm going to tell you where you can listen to it and figure it out yourself. Okay. Two great trumpet players. Check out Kenny Durham and then check out Nat Adderley. Both of them swinging, but the lope is different. You'll understand what I mean by lope when you listen to it. Check out uh, Clifford Brown and check out Freddie Hubbard. Compare the two. Both of them killing, swinging. 
but both of them phrased that Lope is different. Same thing, Wynton Kelly and Bill Evans. Both of them swinging. Both of them killing. The Lopes are different. Observe these. Register your observations, whether you write it down list, or, or just note them in your mind. And uh, then when you practice, you should practice on those things. And eventually you will find out as time goes on, you know, the way that you will play. You'll make those kind of decisions. Well, I like this, so I'm going to do this. Or I would love to do this, but my technique doesn't let me get to that. But my goal is this. Uh, and then, you know, before you know it, you'll have your own style. Okay? Tools to create drama. These things are very important that you should think about along with all the other stuff that you study, but when you start applying it to the way that you're going to play. Your tone, your tone is your signature. It is the most personal thing about your playing. No one in the world is going to sound exactly like you. Your job is to develop that into the best sound that you can get, that only you can get. As much as I love Kenny Garrett, there is no way in the world I'll be able to get his sound. As much as I love Johnny Hodges, there is no way in the world I can get that sound. But there's no way that, John, that Kenny Garrett can get my sound either. So, you know, my, I, I think of it as like Tiger Woods. You play your own game and you're competing against yourself. Work on your sound. Work on your sound to make it as big and beautiful as you can and make it yours. Okay? Space. All right? This is another thing that you have to think about when you start soloing. Space. You cannot play eighth notes like a machine gun all day and expect people to enjoy that. There's no way in the world. You have to use space in your solos. Quarter rests are just as important as quarter notes. A rest is your, is your friend. Leave room in your solos for the audience to hear the rhythm section. Uh, the, the listen to them converse with you, to talk with you, to play with you. Maybe you'll actually hear them if you do that and play with them. Check out how Miles Davis did it. He was a master of that. Playing with space. Utilizing the sound of the rhythm section. When you go play, next time you go to a jam session or have a session with, with some of your classmates and you ought to get together, and you're going to play a solo over blues with the, with the rhythm section, use space. Try it. Something like... <laughs> myself I hear the rhythm section in my mind so I hear what they may play so for me all right that's part of leaving space you can do that ornaments ornaments grace notes turns uh, Glissanos, check out how Clifford Brown used grace notes, all right? They're part of music, and you can use them. Cliff, uh, 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 Joe Henderson, he loves to use trills. Observe that. No one told me this stuff. I just listened to the music and, and, and observed what they did. You can do the same. Make note of these things. Dynamics. Dynamics stimulate the ears. Use dynamics to control the mood, draw attention, uh, assault the, the senses. There's a lot of things you can do with dynamics. You can control how the audience listens to you. I tell you many of times when uh, if you're playing in the club and you have people sitting at the, at the tables and they're talking, they don't realize they're talking loud or they don't care because they had a little bit too much to deal with. Uh, if you play real soft, bring down the volume of the band by the way that you play, then you control the room. Everybody's quiet. Another thing, if you're starting off a song and you leave silence, you space, before you start the song. 
and then you play. You control the mood at that point. Those are techniques that you can use when you're playing solos. All right? Passion. That's the most important thing. It's hard to define what passion is, but, you know, it's putting that feeling into the music. Uh, when you do that, people start to believe in it. Uh, a person who, who is a, uh, who's a, a speaker, uh, the great politicians, uh, uh, they, when they speak, they speak with conviction and with passion in their voice to get you to understand and follow them and whatever crazy mess they may get you into. Okay? You need to have that type of passion in your plan so people that want to listen to you. It's important. You must feel what you're playing. It's not an exercise what you do. You're trying to make somebody feel something. So you need to feel it too. And that leads us to the blues. The blues has to be in everything that you play. If it's not, it's not jazz. Jazz has to have a feeling of the blues. And I'm not talking about a form of blues. I'm not talking about a blues scale, which I, I really don't believe in. All right? You notice when I talk about scales, I never said blues scale. The sound of the blues, the feeling of the blues. The blues is a feeling. It's a sound. It's something that you get in there. Even just play a note with some vibrato on it. If you if you feel that note, that's that's the sound of the blues right there. If you have that feeling in your playing, go back and check out Freddie Hubbard. Go back and check out John Coltrane. Johnny Hodges, Benny Carter, Ellis Marcellus, Winter Marcellus, Roy Hargrove, Josh Redman. Check them out. Philly Joe Jones, Papa Joe Jones. You hear the sound of the blues and the way they play the drums. If you have that into your playing, when you learn all of the other stuff that we talked about, you get to the end, you get to your journey and you have all that stuff with the sound of the blues, or you're gonna be all right. That's it for me. So uh do we have any we have some questions, right? Yeah, somebody was asking earl a little bit earlier um about books and their utility in learning jazz. You mentioned a few things that you, you know, you mentioned the Omni Mook, you meant mentioned sort of a methods book. Um can you maybe then to expound on the balance between, you know, learning by ear and utilizing, you know, more written tools. Okay. Certain, you can use certain books that are out. And this is my own belief. Okay. You can learn, use certain books that are out to teach you how to study on your own. Okay. Say, for instance, there's a great book that I, I used to love, and, and, I, and I still reference people to it, called the, the Jazz Piano Book. I think it's by Mark Levine, uh, the pianist. I played with him uh, in, in, in uh, California. We, we actually worked with, uh, with the Monterey Jazz Festival Band Camp together. Uh, but I knew about his book maybe 10 years before I even met him uh, because it gives you an, a good idea of voicing. On, on uh, how you know how chords are put together and voices, the jazz piano book. That's a good reference. Uh, but again, that's just the beginning of your studying. Basically, if you remember, like I, the way I learned chords were that I learned the scale, and then the arpeggios is what made the chord. That's simple. Uh, it's, it's not much more to that. Now, as far as voicings and things of that nature, yeah, there's a lot to that. Orchestration, yeah, there's a lot to that. But that's your basic starting point. Um, another reference, uh, well, I said the Charlie Parker Omni book because um, some, to me, some of the transcriptions are okay. Uh, but it's just a starting guide. If you hear a note that's wrong, you change it. Uh 
and again, you know, if you, uh, you put in articulations, that's a good way of using a resource like that. Uh, but that's not going to, that's going to give, that's going to give you information, but that's only part of the journey. I was not a big transcriber. I transcribed five, six solos and only one chorus. Uh, for me, listening to the music a lot and then just developing an understanding of music and harmony, which was being taught in school, was enough for me and making my own observations about things. Then I had a great teacher that really put a lot of stuff in perspective. Danny Harper was um, my greatest teacher. Uh, and uh, exposure to a lot of music and then looking at scores and trying to understand what I'm looking at, it put me on the right path. It takes all of that. That's why I, I, that's why I, I went, I, I started thinking about, okay, what can, what can you all learn from uh, that will help you? You can get a you can get a couple of books that will have some of the, the the American Songbook and then listen to the recording and make changes in that and put how jazz musicians have used that and then write your lead sheets from that. But if you fo if you follow these steps, this is going to get you in the right track. There's not going to be a book that say this is how this I'm going to teach you how to play jazz from that book. It's just not there. You know, this is work that you have to do on your own. If you don't listen, all of the books in the world are not going to help you. One of the things I used to do was listen to music in my sleep where it fits into my subconscious. That may work for you and it may not work for you. You know, I feel it worked for me. Awesome. We have maybe one last question. This this could, at the risk of, of setting off a rant here. Uh, <laughs> right, right. What, uh, I had a couple of people asking about what what don't you like and why don't you like to uh, think about the blues scale or, or teach the blues scale? Okay. The blues scale. It, it's to me, it's the most misleading thing in the world. Do you, when you listen to, when you listen to, to, to Art Farmer play the blues, do you hear him playing a blues scale? When you listen to, um, Sonny Red play? Do you hear him play the blues scale? Do, do you hear this? When you listen to Eric Dolphy, do you hear him play the blues scale? No. Dizzy Gillespie? No. The Lonely's Monk? No. It's not, it was a scale to make, to give you like the sound of what maybe a blues may sound like. <laughs> That does nothing for you, in my opinion. Not a thing. When I play, when you hear Charlie Parker play the blues, okay, that right there is a, a, a B flat six chord. He basically saying. G flat right there, all right. That's because I'm changing the quality of the chord. I'm play, I'm changing the E flat seven to an E flat minor. They go back to B flat. Even though I'm using a D flat in there, I'm thinking of a D flat minor seven to E flat. I mean the G flat. To get to the C bottom. Okay. Even though I'm using a D flat in there, that still has nothing to do with a B with a, a B flat blues scale. That's the F seven uh, 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 augmented. 
That's why I said, leave the blue scale alone. It doesn't give you anything. Learn your majors and minors. That has everything that you need. Music was founded on that. Don't, you know, yeah, don't fall into that trap. That has hurt a lot of musicians. Well, awesome. Um, I think we're out of questions and just about out of time. So, uh, well, Sherman, I certainly want to thank you. I want to thank uh, all of our friends at Jazz and Lincoln Center for helping make this possible tonight. Mm -hmm.